All right. So uh, everybody, welcome to this workshop. Again, um, Jared Atkinson. I'm going to be talking about NTFS analysis with PowerShell through uh, my PowerShell module called Power Forensics. Um, just a kind of a little introduction for myself. Um, I'm a hunt capability lead for a, the Adaptive Threat Division at Veris Group, which is a Washington, D.C.-based consulting company. And so we do a lot of like uh, Fortune 100 commercial client uh, hunting and, uh, and uh, red teaming slash pen testing type work. I'm also an adjunct lecturer at Utica College, which is a small college up in upstate New York. And so they have an online cybersecurity program, which I help teach some forensics stuff uh, for that. I uh, develop Power Forensics, obviously. That's what we're talking about today. And then Uproot IDS, which is a WMI event subscription-based IDS. Um, so it's like tru truly agentless. So everybody likes to say agentless is a big uh, buzzword, but Uproot is truly agentless because it uses things that are built into the operating system to detect bad bad activity. And then WMI eventing, which is kind of a helper project for Uproot to try to kind of abstract some things for that. Um, I also do uh, research on forensic artifact file formats, including like NTFS, EXT4, um, and then a lot of the smaller artifacts like prefetch or uh, scheduled jobs, scheduled tasks, all that kind of stuff. Um, my background is, and I make, I make cool posters, which you will get to see today as part of the presentation. Um, my background in general is uh, I spent uh, five or so years in the U.S. Air Force uh, standing up their hunt team. And so hunting was kind of um, using that proactive incident response concept. So you, you're going out and looking for bad under the assumption that if you're the DOD in the United States or a large company, you're probably targeted by somebody. And so you're going and trying to find them before you know they steal all your cookies, I guess. And then uh, I also have a few certifications that make me, I guess, cool. So. Um, so I, I mentioned this yesterday. I, I see a lot of same, same faces. And so um, can't have a PowerShell presentation without an ObscureSec po post. And so uh, ObscureSec is Chris Campbell's handle. And uh, he's kind of a big guy in the offensive PowerShell community. Um, and so uh, he called it uh, Microsoft's post-exploitation platform. So I took some liberties and changed it to Microsoft's digital forensics platform, uh, just to kind of be a little funny, I guess. Um, and so what is pa PowerShell? It's a task-based command line shell. It's that that blue thing that everybody says is really powerful. Um, it's powerful because it's built on the .NET framework. Um, and so um, if you've used C Sharp, you're probably pretty familiar with .NET. And uh, it has a number of different commandlets for performing common system administrative tasks. Um, it has a consistent design in the fact that um, the way that uh, commandlets are named are going to be the same. So it uses a verb dash noun naming syntax. So you would have like git process or stop process, so on and so forth. Um, and then it also has, uses similarly named parameters. So if you want to establish a remote connection to something, you would use the dash computer name parameter. Or um, if you want verbose output, you would use the dash verbose output or parameter. And so you, you would understand just from your use with PowerShell kind of what to expect with each commandlet. Um, it has powerful object manipulation capabilities. A lot of people will say that PowerShell is object oriented. I, I think that's kind of a misnomer. .NET is actually object oriented. And so PowerShell, because it is built on top of .NET, is able to access, has uh, capabilities to access .NET objects. And then uh, it's extensible, which is kind of the, the thing that I'm taking advantage of in this, in this example is um, PowerShell comes pre-built with a lot of things built into it. Um, but we're able to, through the use of modules, PowerShell modules, which I'll kind of explain here in a second, um, we're able to actually extend the capabilities of PowerShell to kind of do our own thing. And so one of the things that you can extend, it, or one of the things that makes extending PowerShell so awesome is that it has the full, full access to the Windows API. And so uh, if, if anybody's, for those familiar with C Sharp, they've probably seen uh, P, P Invoke or Platform Invoke, which allows you to um, it's basically what .NET is built off of, but it allows you from, C, from managed code to be able to access the unmanaged Windows APIs. And so um, you can call things like create file or virtual alloc or all these different things straight from PowerShell. Um, you could also use Reflection, which uh, if any of you know Matt Graber, uh, Manifestation with Power, PowerSploit, he uses Reflection instead of pinvoke because it's a little cleaner when you're doing uh, malicious things. So, um, and then so talking about Power, power Forensics, um, yesterday, I kind of talked about my hunting philosophy, and so the idea is, is that you have kind of a detection, investigate, investigation, and response loop that you're constantly in, right? And so you want to detect bad stuff, you want to investigate to make sure that you're, you actually found bad stuff, or whether it's a, a benign uh, incident. 
and then you want to go ahead and respond to that in some way. And so Power Forensics specifically uh, kind of answering that investigation problem. Um, the, the thing that I've seen in my experience is that people are either really good at detection or they're really good at investigation. And so you have people that um, know how to find you know, abnormalities in their network. Um, but they don't know how to investigate to scale, right? And so they're, uh, and then you have people that know how to do traditional digital forensics where they will, you know, pull a hard drive and then go through that, um, but they don't know how to detect at scale. And so you're kind of, power forensics is kind of trying to mash those two things together and make a, a little love child that can do that at scale. So um, in building this, uh, and I, t I talked about this again yesterday, so I'll kind of go fast, but in building this, I had some requirements. Um, I wanted it to be centralized. A lot of times you'll find in, in forensics, there's all these d disparate tools that you have to kind of mash together in order to get it to do what you want. And so, for example, um, to get the MFT, you would have to use raw copy or something along those lines to copy out the MFT. Then you would have to use MFT parse or um, some sort of third part, fourth party um, M MFT parser. And so I wanted to kind of build that all together. I want it to be forensically sound, which uh, the kind of the I'll explain on the next slide what forensically sound means. So, um, go into more detail on that. I want it to execute on a live host, so we're trying to do in, you know enterprise type scale. And so, if you can't execute on a, on a running host, then you're probably not mad, uh, answering that problem. Um, I want it to be operationally fast, so things need to happen in seconds or minutes, as opposed to hours or days, or even months. Um, I want it to be modular, so I want everything to, to be a very, answer a very discrete task, but I want it to kind of be built in such a way that it could all be tied together um, to perform more complicated tasks. And then I want it to be capable of working remotely. That is, out of all of these, the one that is at the proof of concept stage. It's not really um, fully worked out yet. So, What is forensically sound? The idea is, is that the, the when you're collecting evidence, um, originally it was, you know, you need to make a bit-for-bit -bit copy, and then you need to investigate that, and then you need to prove that the initial copy is the same as the copy after you did your investigation to prove that you, you didn't change anything, right? And so that, that's probably really important when you're doing some law enforcement type, uh, type case, but an incident response um, on an enterprise level, you're prob one, you're probably not going to take anybody to court because they don't live in the country that you are responding to, most likely. And two, um, you know, at the end of the day, protecting your customer's data or your own uh, intellectual property is probably more important than worrying about some forensics chain of custody. And so the idea that I like to operate it under is that the manner used to obtain the evidence must be documented and should be justified to the extent possible, right? And so you want to take as little, as little um, effect on the, the medium that you're uh, investigating as possible. But if you have to do something in order to uh, actually investigate that system, then you should do it. And so uh, now I'm kind of going through all those different requirements. And so one of them is that forensics toolbox. This is what a typical forensics person's you know, jump bag or toolbox looks like. And I want it to ultimately look like this, right? And so it's just you know, all centralized within PowerShell. And so this is what it would look like. Um, inside of Power Forensics, you have all of these different uh, commandlets that allow you to do certain things from a forensics perspective. And we'll go, we'll go through and talk about those as that's basically what we're doing today. Um, from the fr forensically sound perspective, this is kind of how I justify myself. And so um, the way Power Forensics works under the hood is it gets a handle to the physical drive or the physical lo or the logical volume, so all the way down at the probably the lowest layer that you possibly can in a hard drive. And then, uh, and then what it does is it parses out the first 512 bytes, which represent the master boot record. And it looks for things, basically, the, and I'll talk more about the master boot record. It finds the first bootable partition, which would typically be the C drive on a Windows uh, system. And the bootable is told by the status. Um, basically, there's a byte right here that's going to represent the status, and that byte is going to be 80 if it's bootable. It determines that the partition is an NTFS partition, based on this little table guy in the, in the left corner. And then, uh, and then it's going to look for where the relative start sector is and the total sectors to determine the size of that partition. Then it's going to move on to that partition. And inside of that partition, the first 512 bytes will be the volume boot record. It's going to uh, find out a few things about kind of the way that the volume is structured. And so um, bytes per, per sector, the default is 512. And in this case, that's, that's going to be what it is. And then there's eight sectors per cluster, which means that a cluster is 4096 bytes. And so now you know, you know how you're going to be reading and uh, treating the medium that you're working with. 
You also know that the master file table, so the volume boot record points to the master file table, which is the uh, metadata structure that contains information about every file on the volume. And so that's at a uh, relative offset from the volume, um, C0000, in this case, hex. And then you want to know how many clusters are in the MFT record. And so I'll, uh, in this case, that, that number is going to represent 1024, and I'll explain how that actually works in a second. And then, you know, at the end of the day, you end up with this master file table record, and uh, this is the thing that we're going to be spending probably the most of our day on because it's pretty, pretty complex. So. And then uh, I, I mentioned that I want this to be operationally fast, and so I don't, I don't know how many of you have uh, ever parsed the master file table using some tool, um, but this tool does it in 3.8 seconds on a Windows 8 system, and it has 200,000 uh, file records, so that's relatively fast. The first time that I... I like wrote the parsing code and then I ran it. It took 45 minutes, and it's now down to 3.8 seconds. So that's uh, a pretty pretty good scale, I guess. And then the like the USN Journal, which has 360,000 records uh, parsed in 3.5 seconds. So that's that's also pretty good, I think. So all right. So um, talking about PowerShell modules, the idea is is that. Uh, Microsoft was smart enough to allow you to write modules to kind of extend the capability of PowerShell. So they they started off by uh, including a ton of different commandlets to let you do administrative type tasks, but they knew that they weren't adding or allowing, you know, creating commandlets that allowed you to do everything that you would ever want to do. And so they're giving you the ability to create your own. And so that's what modules do. So um, I'm going to kind of talk about how to download Power Forensics and get it set up, and then I'll kind of show that in the lab. So this might be a part that you kind of want to follow through if you're actually trying to uh, follow along. So, so to download it, you could either go to uh, github.com slash invoke-ir slash powerforensics, or just uh, download.powerforensics.invoke-ir.com. And so I'll give everybody a second to kind of do that. If if you go to download.powerforensics, it will literally just download a zip file. That's what that is set up to do. If you go to GitHub, you'll have to click this, uh, the download and zip icon down in the bottom right corner. Does anybody need more time for that URL? Okay. Okay, so then what happens is uh, when you use Internet Explorer to download uh, files, it creates a zone identifier um, alternate data stream, which we will talk about going forward. But um, all you have to know right now is that PowerShell does not allow inherently things to be executed that were downloaded from the Internet. Um, and so all you have to do is go into uh, either type in if you have PowerShell version 3, so if you're on uh, Windows 8 or greater, uh, type in unblock file and then the path to that zip file. Um, that you just downloaded, or you can go and right click on that zip file, go to properties, and then click the unblocked button. If you're on Windows 10, it's, it's not a button, it's a checkbox. So. But if you didn't use Internet Explorer, that's still an issue. I don't know, to be honest. So, we could try. That's the advanced dragon did it, okay. Okay, yeah, then. If, if you right click on it and go to properties and there's an unblock icon, then you probably should just go ahead and click oh. it. <laughs> Do you use Google Chrome or something like that? Uh, I've used uh, something called Komodo Ice Dragon. Oh, okay. I have a number of browsers. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I don't know. I don't know what. I'm sure there's other browsers that probably uh, use the zone identifier thing, but it's not like a mandatory deal, and it's all based on how the browser wants to work. So, yeah. probably the more obscure the the browser is, the less likely it is to use the zone identifier tag. Not so. All right. So once you have that. Um, Modules can be executed from anywhere, but it's a lot easier if you put the modules in the module path. And so um, there's a value, an environment variable in PowerShell. So if you open PowerShell as an administrator, which is key, you have to be an administrator, um, then you go ahead and do uh, get child item env colon slash ps module path. And that will print out basically an array of different things that are in that path. And so um, what you have to do is you have to rename the module to just plain Power Forensics, the word Power Forensics. So there, I think it says like Power Forensics dash master dash, you know, some random, ran, random numbers. Just change it to Power Forensics and then put it into one of the directories that are on your module path. I just go with whatever the top one is typically. There's, there are things to know about module paths, and if you are really interested, there's this uh, URL down here to kind of explain that to you. 
But in the case of the lab, we, we don't really care. All right, and then the last thing you need to do is actually import the module into your session. And so that's through the commandlet import dash module, go figure. And then uh, you give it a, tech, a dash name option and give it power forensics and it will, uh, it will load. If you're using Windows 8 or Windows 10, it should, you just type in like power and you'd be able to tab and it'll, it should tab complete for you. If it gives you an error, then it did it give you an error, or did it work? Oh, okay. Um. Yeah, so extract it as Power Forensics as the name of the directory that you're extracting it to. And it should be should be good to go. And what I'm going to do is go ahead and show you how I would install the module. So we're going to pretend like I downloaded it from the internet. Um, it's just sitting here on my desktop. And so uh, what, you, what you do is you go to Properties here, and you just unblock. And so you want to, the idea is, is to unblock it before you extract the zip. Otherwise, you have to unblock every single file within the zip. And so that's more of a pain in the butt. And then you, I just kind of double click, drag that thing out to my desktop, because it's easier to work that way. Rename it to Power Forensics. So now it's just named Power Forensics. And then the, the path that I like to use is Windows System 32, Windows PowerShell, version 1.0, modules. And so that's the path there. See Windows System 32, Windows PowerShell, version 1.0, modules. And then you just drag that bad boy right in there, click Continue. And so now you should be able to, let me put this guy over here real quick. And so now to kind of check that, you could do, uh, there's a couple things you could do. One is git command dash module power forensics. And it will tell you all the different command lists that are loaded up for you. Or you can do git module uh, dash name power forensics and it will kind of do a similar thing. It's not quite, the name of the command lists that are loaded aren't quite as clear. And so it's a little easier to do the git command in my opinion. Is anybody having trouble with that? Because I could try to go through and we could probably figure this part out pretty easy. So I need to get into the... Oh, go ahead and get rid of the first slash on there in front of C. Oh, yes. Uh, well, are you sure? Oh, yeah, yep. Okay, that'll be for me. Yeah, and then... Just in and then Windows PowerShell. I don't need the... Yeah, slash Windows PowerShell. Or CD to Windows PowerShell, I guess. So a lot of times it's easier if you just kind of go through the file explorer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got you. I'm there now. Okay. Sorry, I was a bit slow from that. Right? Oh, no problem. So now it's command import. Yeah, so you don't actually... Import module doesn't care where, you're, where you are. It just happens that I was in, in there. Yeah, so then you just type in Power Forensics and it should be. And just hit that. Enter, yep. Yeah. Hmm, where did you extract it to? I actually put it in, uh, I just put it in my own. Oh, yeah, so then you'll have to give it the full path. So that it's, it's typically better if you okay. kind of go back one directory. Okay, yeah, yeah. And then we'll put it in there. Yeah, there you go. So. So that's yeah, I'm do like a control X or a cut, a cut yeah, or yeah, something. Yeah. And then uh, go to C Windows. Uh, System 32. And then slash Windows PowerShell. Yeah, if you type in Windows, it'll. Yeah, and then just push down or click that. Yeah. 
and then click version 1.0 there. We're close enough to our yeah. clicking span. Okay. Modules, yeah. And then just paste it in there. Okay. So, did you get it? I'm not getting it. I think I've got it in the right place, but I'm not getting it. Um, uh, open that directory real quick. How do I not copy Okay, now that looks like it should be good. Um, I am running as an administrator on this. Unless I'm doing something stupid and typed it incorrectly. Hmm. Restart pattern? Uh, for some reason, yeah, that directory's there, so... I don't know why that's... Yeah, re try restarting PowerShell and see what happens. Let's see, okay, looks like you're good. You're good, okay. Okay, go back. Did we spell? Let's see. Power four and six. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure what the issue is here. <laughs> and you unblocked it beforehand? Oh, I did unblock it. Um, I can quickly try it again. Okay. Um, yeah, keep keep trying it, and we'll when when I get to the next lab, we'll yeah. see what's going on. All right, so it looks like most most folks are kind of good there. So, uh, so now that we have it kind of built out, we have the module installed. Kind of the first thing is invoke DD. That's probably like the most traditional forensics capability, right? Being able to make a bit for bit copy of of something, and so um, kind of invoke DD is ultimately the thing that everything else like builds off of, right? And you have to be able to get bits from the from the hard drive in order to be able to parse out the master boot record and things like that. And so uh, it allows for raw access to physical drives or logical volumes. And it uses platform invoke to call create file uh, Windows API. So create file allows you to get a handle to a file. In this case, we're saying like physical drive zero or slash slash dot slash C colon. And it will allow us to get a handle to that drive and then start reading directly from the drive as opposed to um, reading from files. And so um, let's see. The one caveat is, is that this block size value here needs to be at least uh, a multiple of 512 because that, when you're reading directly from a hard drive, you have to read in sector, si sector chunks. And so you have to read in multiples of 512 because that's how big sectors are. And so, uh, let's see here. Get rid of that guy, let's see. And so this is another system, but it, basically the same, same concept. You can do in file and do like slash slash physical drive zero, and then specify off, offset zero, and block size 512, and then count as one. And so um, basically when you run that, it's going to just print out 512 bytes, the first 512 bytes of the physical drive, right? And so um, PowerShell doesn't play very nicely with bytes. It displays them in decimal, and so it doesn't, it's not very, very pretty. But what you can do is if you put uh, parentheses around it and then put a zero uh, reference an array at, at offset zero you can pipe that into format hex and so the reason why you have to do this this parentheses thing is actually a bug with format hex not with DD and so when you do that now you can see what this is actually looking like right and so it's going to be a hex dump for you and so you can see things like invalid partition table, error loading operating system, missing operating system, so on and so forth and so what this really is is the uh, hex re representation or the, bit, the byte representation of the master boot record, the first 512 bytes of the drive. And so um, all, of these, all of these random bytes actually mean something, and so we, uh, we'll kind of talk about that here in a second. All right, so uh, boot sectors, there's two different major boot sectors. One is the master boot record and one is the GUID partition table. Uh, we'll talk about both of them and kind of the differences between the two. The master boot record is kind of the traditional BIOS boot record. It's associated with kind of like that BIOS uh, firmware uh, format. And then uh, it's the first sector of the disk, so the first 512 bytes. Um, it's also referred to as the boot sector. Um, it's kind of made up of two parts. One set is the boot code, which is actual like assembly instructions that are going to tell um, the system what to do. And then it's going to have a partition table, which 
basically allows you to create different logical volumes that contain that are formatted with file systems and things of that nature. And so uh, by default, you're able to have four uh, different partitions. And so that's built in. There's actually space in the master boot record for four partitions. Um, and then they've also come up with this concept called extended partitions, which are significantly more complicated, but they allow you to uh, have some you know, ungodly amount of partitions. I think like 128 partitions on your system. And so you'll run out of drive letters before you run out of partitions is the, the idea. And so this is, uh, again, the, the, cons the master boot record picture. And so we see um, kind of this red section, the yellow section, and the green section makes up that, uh, that boot code. And ultimately, what the boot code is doing is it, it's telling the, uh, the computer to look for the partition table, which is going to be you know, this section down here. And then it's going to try to find the first uh, bootable. Oh, whoops! Apparently, I didn't build that out. Okay. Um, then it's going to find the first bootable partition. So you notice that in this case, there are two partitions. The the other two are completely zeroed out, so they don't they don't mean anything. I don't know how well you can actually see that, but um, and so you're looking for the one that has an 80 in the first byte of the partition, which means it's bootable. And then it's going to try to figure out where um, that that partition actually resides. And so that's this relative start sector. And then it, it figures out how big that, that partition actually is. And so um, what the bo master boot record is, it's going to find the bootable partition, the first bootable partition. Then it's going to actually make sure that you don't have multiple bootable partitions, because that will cause some sort of error, because it doesn't make sense. Um, then it will figure out where the partition is actually stored on the drive, pass execution, CPU execution, to that location, and then start executing from there. And so um, we have this this uh, commandlet, which allows us to kind of check out the, the master boot record, and that's called git mbr. So um, coming back to kind of our PowerShell, we can go ahead and do git mbr for master boot record, give it a path, and you'll get really used to typing in this physical drive zero. And so if we hit that, we're going to see um, you know, the mbr signature, the disk signature, and then the partition table. And so um, the partition table tells us that there's one NTFS partition on this, this particular drive. Yours may be different depending on how you have your disk formatted. Um, one cool thing that I kind of wanted to show um, is the concept of bootkits. So attackers can actually install um, a type of malware called bootkits. And so uh, the idea is, is to replace the code that you know, is in this section of the master boot record with uh, their own code. And then that code is going to be executing before the operating system, so it's technically in ring zero, and uh, it's going to be kernel level execution. And so uh, Matt Graber, the, the PowerSploit guy, came out with this tool called set master boot record, and it allows you to like basically overwrite a master boot record with if you have administrative privileges, right? And so um, he does it just to kind of write a message, but in theory you can write your own assembly code to jump out and ex and do some weird stuff. I don't know, who knows, and then uh, and then come back, and so. Um, Git MBR actually takes into consideration the concept of boot, boot code uh, manipulation, and so it will notify you if there's tampering. And so uh, on this guy, what we can do is we can import module. This is just kind of a, a demo here. Let's see, set master boot record. No, screw you. We'll show them. Uh, 44 con demo. OK, so um, OK, so now you see, hey, there's some unknown, you know, unknown boot code going on, right? And so um, there, there is one really well-known uh, piece of uh, boot code uh, malware that is going to store off the original master boot record somewhere else on the disk. And every time you try to ask for the first sector of the drive, it will just go to that place on the disk and return you uh, the false information. But the majority of uh, boot code or boot, boot loaders or what, what are they called, boot kits, um, will will actually just you know return whatever it is, and so in this case, if we were to do if we were to reboot this guy, uh, restart, 
it'll it's going to pop up really fast, so you kind of have to keep keen eyes here. Sure, whatever. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh man. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny. And come on. Okay, so here it says 44 con demo, and that's what, uh, you know, so I overwrote the boot record to just say, apparently it comes with a PowerShell uh, prompt. It's supposed to look like that, who knows? Um, anyway, so um, in real life, a boot kit's not going to just brick your box unless that's their intention. It's going to have some sort of covert communication or something along those lines, and so you, in theory, would be able to detect that, assuming that they haven't taken specific countermeasures to, to lie to you. All right. So, like I said, if you were to do that format hex dump, hex, or the hex dump on the master boot record, you would see this is what a normal master boot record looks like, and this is what uh, a corrupted master boot record looks like. They, they could do things like maintain the partition table and things of that nature, but in theory, it's just going to be different looking, right? And so you can uh, basically hash the boot code and then look and see if the boot code has changed. And so boot code is unique per operating system. So all Windows 7 operating systems are going to have the same boot code. All Windows 8 operating systems are going to have the same boot code. And there's my little screenshot for that. All right, so the next thing, um, more recently they've started uh, to replace the boot sector, so the, the MBR, with the GUID partition table or the GPT. And this has really kind of uh, started becoming popular with the UEFI compliant devices. So the U UEFI uh, standard actually says that all UEF UEFI compliant devices must support the GUID <coughs> partition table. And so it's a new partitioning scheme. Um, it maintains a protective MBR, which is uh, the first, it's going to be the first uh, sector on disk, and that's for compatibility with kind of older BIOS style devices. And then uh, it's an alternative to the legacy master boot record. So um, one of the a couple of the cool things are is that it increases partition size from uh, two two tibi, 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 tibi bytes or something. I don't know two two point two terabytes, whatever it is, to eight uh, zebabytes. So um, it, pretty significant increase. If anybody has an eight zebabyte uh, hard drive, let me know. I will be pretty impressed. Um, and then uh, it supports many primary partitions. So like I said, MBR has space for four primary partitions as to where the GPT has uh, room for significantly more than that. I think it's like 128 by default. And then uh, it creates a primary and backup partition table in case somebody jacks up your partition table, you can uh, recall the, the good one. So this is what the GPT looks like. We're gonna start kind of over here. So the first 512 bytes of the disk are gonna be this protective MBR, which works functionally the same as the master boot record. The only difference is, is that we have a system ID of EE uh, hex, which represents the EFI, EFI GPT partition. And then we have the GPT header section offset. So remember we had the relative sec, uh, offset of the partition. Well, th we're following the same rules as the MBR, but now it's pointing us to a GPT table, right? Or a, a GPT table, that's redundant. Um, and so we're getting to the GPT header. GPT header has a bunch of interesting stuff, but ultimately what we're looking for is where the partition uh, table is. And so the partition table is gonna be represented here, and it's gonna be at, uh, at sector two. And so um, we're gonna go down to that sector, and then we see, in this case, my GPT has uh, three different partitions. And so in order to kind of look at that, I have a command line called git GPT. This uh, likely will not work for many of you um, because you have MBR formatted devices. I just happen to have like 37 virtual hard drives on my VM. Um, and so uh, the idea is that you run git GPT against the GPT formatted device and it's gonna return a GPT object. And so uh, if it is an MBR formatted device, it will error and tell you to use git MBR instead. And so, oh. and so the idea is just git GPT path slash 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 physical drive one. And so when we hit that, now it comes out with the GPT. Um, so a lot of you may not know whether your GPT or MBR uh, formatted, and so I just created a boot, git boot sector commandlet to kind of do the smart smarts for you. And so the idea is you could do git boot sector, and then we could do physical drive zero. And it's going to come back as an MBR, but if I change it to physical drive one, it's going to come back as a GPT. And so you don't even have to worry about the, whether or not your uh, GPT or MBR formatted with physical git boot sector. 
So all these will be public. I'm going through some of these kind of quickly, but it, this, these slides will be public. Um, you can also uh, go ahead and just dump the partition table, and so it's going to have the same smarts as uh, it's going to have the same smarts as Git boot sector, and so we can do. And it's going to dump out the, these are GPT partitions. And so you can usually tell by the gigantic GUID that represents the type of partition. Or you can do, come on, let's do two. So this is a, a drive that's using extended partitions. And so in this case, it has, uh, what's that, eight, seven, seven partitions or eight partitions. And so uh, this would be an MBR partition table with using extended partitions. So. All right, so kind of that, that's kind of the overview. That's going to be MBR and GPT stuff. Is, uh, it's common between all different types of operating systems. So the MBR and GPT are going to be common on Linux, Windows, BSD, whatever you're using. So um, Mac has the, the MBR and GPT. So now we're getting specifically into NTFS, which is the common uh, file system used by Windows operating systems. Um, NTFS has a number of different system files. So these are like protected hidden files from you. And, uh, but they kind of give you all the data about how the uh, file system is being used and allow the file system to do certain things. And so uh, the ones that are you know, kind of relevant to us are the $MFT file, which is the master file table. So it's going to contain information about every file on disk. The log file, which is a tra transaction log. So every time you know, changes happen to the file system, it's going to update the log file with some data. Um, the volume, dollar volume file, which has... Uh, Basically, data about the volume itself. So, if you've named if you've named your volume, then it's going to have like the volume name, things of that nature. The adder def file, which has uh, data about attributes, and so uh, the MFT every record has a number of different attributes. Those are all defined within the adder def file. Uh, record number five is going to be the root directory. So, like c colon slash, that's going to be represented by record number five, and so that's an important thing to know. And then you have like the bitmap uh, file. The bitmap tells the file system what, what clusters are actually being used by, uh, to store files and what files can be used, what files are available to be used uh, to store more files. And then you have the dollar boot, which is actually a, the same file as the, vo it's actually the volume boot record represented as a file. And so um, NTFS stores literally everything as a file. And so the, even the volume boot record is a file. Um, and then the bad cluster, so if, if you've ever seen like a corrupt cluster on, on a hard drive, the file system will actually keep track of that and mark them as bad inside of, a, inside of a bit field. And so the bad cluster file is where that information is stored. And then there's a, a directory called dollar extend, which contains a bunch of files within it, one of which is the US and journal, which I think is probably one of the most compelling disk uh, artifacts that you can find when doing a forensic investigation. So I'll talk about those as we go. Uh, volume boot record, so the volume boot record is first sector of the partition, so first 512 bytes. Um, it's pointed to by the master boot record or the GPT. Um, loads, the, loads the boot manager and defines partition attributes such as the bytes per sector, the sectors per clusters, total sectors, uh, location of MFT, so on and so forth. Uh, once again, this is what it looks like. The key things that we're looking at um, when we're doing forensics are the MFT first cluster number and then the clusters per uh, MFT record. And so you'll, no you'll notice earlier I said um, each MFT record is going to be 1024 bytes, um, but the number is F6, which doesn't match up with 1024, no matter what type of math you're using. And so uh, F6 is actually a, um, a, basically it represents negative 10, and so it's a, un it's a signed uh, integer, or un signed short. And so uh, F6 equals uh, negative 10, and so, uh, the way that this, this value actually works is if the value is negative, then you take 2 raised to the negative 1 times the value. So uh, negative 10 turns into 10, and you raise two, you take 2 and raise it to, to the 10th power. And so it equals 1024. And that took a really long time to figure out. Um, and so that, that's how that works. So each file record is 1024 bytes. And that's, I mean, I've never seen a file system that doesn't use 1024 bytes for the, for the file records. But in theory, it could be changed. So uh, once again, we have, you know, just like everything else, get volume boot record will allow us to parse out that volume boot record. And so um, typically when you're doing an investigation, the volume boot record is not that important. But when you're doing things like uh, invoke DD and you want to know how big a cluster is, the volume boot record will tell you that. And so um, in this case, bytes, bytes per cluster is going to be, whoops, 
10, uh, 4096. And so you can store this into a variable like $VBR here, and then you can reference $VBR to keep that kind of stored throughout your investigation. I won't touch on that because it's not super cool. Um, then we'll talk about the master file table. So this is literally kind of like the, the thing that keeps track of every file on the file system. Probably one of the more complex uh, artifacts and probably one of the mo most uh, valuable when you're doing an investigation. If, if I could tell you there's you know, two things that you need to grab when you're doing an investigation, it's the master file table and the US and journal. And uh, you will be able to figure out a lot about what happened on a system over a period of time. And so uh, it's the first. It's, it's funny because it's a file that keeps track of files, but it, keep, it also is a file itself. So it's a self-referencing, weird, kind of very computer science-y type thing. And then, uh, so it contains at least one entry for every file on an MTF, NTFS volume. Um, as files are added, the MFT will grow to kind of accommodate for that. And then when files are deleted, the MFT actually will not, uh, or the file system will not actually like literally delete a file. It will just mark in the MFT record for that file that it's unallocated. And so now, now the file system can go back and overwrite that when it needs to, but for performance reasons, it doesn't, it doesn't overwrite it unless it has to. And so that's how you can actually recover files um, that have been deleted. And then each record contains things like uh, timestamps, uh, file name and details, so the past, the number of hard links, these types of things, and then the location of the, the actual contents of the file. This is what it looks like. So um, it's going to have a very small header um, it's 1024 bytes in size, like I said. It's going to have a small header with like a file magic signature or a, a signature of the word file in ASCII. And then it's going to have an, a number of different things. Uh, the cool, the kind of, we get into the cool stuff when we start looking at these different attributes and I'll kind of start to explain those. But it also tells you, you know, like the real and allocated size of the file and so on and so forth. So, um, just like everything else, there's a commandlet to do this. And so we can do get file. Record volume name c colon, which is referencing the logical volume as opposed to the physical drive in this, in this case. And so $MFT equals get file record dash volume name slash slash dot slash c colon. And so if, you, if you're trying to look at the e drive, you would do e colon, um, so on and so forth. So that finished. $MFT dot length. So it's an array of two, 200,000 MFT records, right? And so um, Remember I just said that uh, the, M the very first record in the MFT is record zero, or is the MFT record for the MFT itself is record zero. And so if we look at you know, offset zero into the MFT array, then we're going to have the MFT. And so mine, mine looks a little bit different than yours because I've been actually changing the code um, to add a few more things. And so you see uh, the, all, the, all the times, but you also see the times from the file name uh, attribute as well. And so I'll talk about how that could be compelling here in a bit. Um, you can also get the, so you don't have to get all file records, you can get individual file records, and so you can do that by path, or you can do it by index number. So if you were to do uh, dash index zero, you would get the MFT record for the MFT itself only, but you could also do something like C Windows notepad.exe and get the MFT record for notepad. So uh, we'll just do that real quick. Oh, not file hash record. And so here you see notepad.exe. It's record number 24212, right? Who, who would have known that? Um, apparently, the master file table knows that. And so so uh, I just showed that you can pull out 200,000 records. Um, and so obviously, that's more than I want to look through, right? But what you can do is you can do uh, what they call temporal fun funneling. And so you can actually create a date time object in .NET and then uh, basically pivot off of those dates in order to kind of reduce your scope. And so I, I don't really know what dates to use on this system, but in concept, you would be able to say, hey, I want to look from 2000, you know, let's say August 21st, 2015, from 1305, uh, so 105 p.m. to 205 p.m. And then you would see, only, in this case, only MFT records which were created uh, between those two times. And so that allows you to really kind of narrow your scope on what you're looking at. So that's pretty pretty cool concept. Um, I guess I could do a demo. We'll see. We'll see how this works. So it's the year, the month, the dates. I'm just going to make something up here. And then, um, then the hour, so we'll say. 
the minute and the seconds. And so when I show dollar star now, it's August 11, 2015, 5, p.m. And so just to kind of make sure that I will actually have results, we'll do uh, where object is the commandlet that kind of lets you, it's a object-oriented grep, for lack of a better explanation. Born time is greater, th greater than dollar start. And so these are all files. You could say that to a variable, but these are all files that were created after that time that I just specified. And so uh, let's, let's just do that. No, that's not what I wanted to do. And so now we're at 5,000 as opposed to 200,000, which is a much smaller you know, group of files to look at. All right, so uh, the master file table, I mentioned that it has a ton of different attributes. Um, this is a list of the different attributes. The ones that are important because they come up pretty frequently are the standard information, the file name, the volume name, volume information, data, index root, and index allocation. And so I'll go through and kind of discuss each one. So this is what a standard information attribute looks like. So um, Attributes are going to have specific common headers. So there's a header that every single attribute is going to have. It's 16 bytes long. And it tells you the type of attribute, the size of the attribute, and then some, some other stuff that's probably not super important. Um, and then there's a re what they call a res resident and non-resident attributes. And so all resident attributes are going to have a resident header, which tells you how big the resident portion of the attribute is. And then the offset to the attribute so, um, so that you can know where to start. And so Here's the actual standard information attribute. And that's going to that's gonna contain things like the born modified access and change times. And then it's also going to have things like a reference into the USN journal for the most recent USN journal entry. And so you can kind of pivot from standard information attributes into the USN journal, which I'll talk about here in a second. Um, kind of the big thing that we're looking at here are the, are in standard information are the actual uh, timestamps here. And so, um, when you talk about time stomping, when you change times, the times that you're changing are these times inside of the standard information attribute. Um, the next guy that you'll see is the file name attribute. It also has that common and resident header. Um, and then it also has the, uh, the parent record number. So it has a reference to what parent directory it resides in. And then it has the name of the file itself. So hello world.txt in this case. Um, it also has the, some more born modified change and access times. And so um, when, you, when you do time stomping, you're time stomping those standard information uh, timestamps, but you're not time stomping those file name timestamps. And so Windows has built it to where it's, there's an API that allows you to change timestamps on standard information, but the file name timestamps don't get changed. And so there, there is some research into the idea that you can compare those times and then look for evidence of time stomping. There's a lot of false positives, and so that's why I haven't written a commandlet to do that yet. But um, in general, if somebody time stomped, that will be the case, um, that the standard information will be older, older than the file name. And so the important things here are the actual file name itself and then the parent record number. And then you have the data attribute, right? And so just like it sounds, it's the place where the data is actually stored. Um, there's kind of two ways that you'll get your data attribute. One is through this, uh, what they call the resident data attribute, to where the data is so small that it can actually be stored within that 1024 bytes of the MFT record. And so that's like a text file that's like a, the hello world text file here. Um, the words hello world are small enough, or the bytes that represent that ASCII representation are small enough to actually fit within that uh, 1024 bytes of the MFT record. So it's stored resident within the MFT record. The next part is kind of one of the more complicated uh, attributes. This is when the contents of a file or the contents of an attribute are so, so large that they can't be stored uh, resident within the MFT record. And so they call it a non-resident attribute. And so um, the interesting thing is that you have these guys down here called data runs. And what those data runs are, are um, in this case, this is a highly fragmented file um, that also has sparse entries at the beginning. And so the idea is, is you take this, for example, 32C02104DC68, and you break it out to where 3 represents uh, the start, so the offset, and then 2 represents the length. And so you would read, in this case, um, 
6.8 DC 04, so it's all a little Indian, so you have to read it backwards. And then, uh, and then it's going to go for a length of 21 CO hex bytes. And, so, and then they all add on top of each other, so in this case, the next one would be uh, A, B, C3, um, and then it goes for 80 bytes. And notice that this number plus A, B, C3 is going to equal this number. And so really complicated, but the idea is, is that this tells you where all the different fragments for file contents are. And this is going to be kind of, the, kind of the cool thing here. So what we can do is, let's see. So I have this hello world. So if we get content for hello world dot, or, oh, shoot. Then it says hello, right? And that's a good thing it says hello. I was worried that it might say something bad. Um, and then so what I can do is I can do get file record dash path c colon temp slash hello world. It's going to tell me, hey, I'm record number 184381, right? And so, you know, that's, that's cool to know. And so what I can do is I can just say del hello world or slash temp hello world. And so now if I were to try to do that directory listing, it's going to say, hey, that file doesn't exist anymore. But if we do get file record and do it by index in this case, and then give it this record number. You see that hello world still exists, like this, this record number. The problem is, is that um, it's marked as deleted. That's all, that's all NTFS does when you delete a file, is just say, you know, change one bit to say, hey, this file is now deleted. I don't care about it anymore. Well, inside of that, save it as a variable, and then we'll just do $r.attribute. And so here we see these things that I was talking about. So we see a standard information attribute, which has a bunch of timestamps. We see, in fact, two file name attributes, one for the like short DOS name. So what is it, 8, eight tilde 1 or whatever they call it. And then you see the actual file name. And then you see in this case that there's uh, an alternate data stream. Um, but you see the, the data block here. So what we can do is, or what number is that? That would be 3. So this is the data, and then we could do raw data. And these are the contents. So I think what we could do is, yeah, let's, And you see, oh, it's apparently Unicode and formatted, but. And so the idea is that we just, you know, recovered that file in some semblance. Now that there's like not a lot of logic to how, uh, how long that's going to be there. And so on like a VM where you have a relatively small hard drive, um, the master file table is going to have to reuse uh, those MFT records pretty rapidly. And so it's going to get overwritten. On a, on a very large hard drive, those things could be around for you know years possibly. And so um, there are other concepts of like file carving to where you actually just go through unallocated space on the hard drive and look for uh, evidence of files. And so um, that's one another way, but this is kind of the most direct way to to recover a file. Uh, let's see. All right, so another thing that we can do is, you can do git contents, uh, see windows. So git content will just read the contents of a file. So like on that hello world, it just typed out the hello word in there, right? And so um, system32, config, sam, right? I want to read the sam hive, right? And so when I do that, it says, hey, hey, you jerk, you can't do that because the sam is being used by another process. Well, I, I decided to like kind of stick it to the man and say git content raw. And so when I do that, I don't kind of flash by the, oh, come on, control C. It's way up there. The SAM has a lot of blank space inside of it. Okay, there we go. And so you see all of this junk here? That's actually representative of a registry hive, right? And so this is the header for a registry file. And in this case, it's the uh, system root, system32, config, SAM file. And so you can actually access the raw bytes of a file without access. And so I never, I never am technically touching the SAM hive. What I'm doing is I'm subverting and using those data runs in order to 
tell me where on the hard drive the SAM hive is actually stored. And so um, if we, oh, come on. So now we have, this is the contents of the SAM file record for the MFT. And so you see standard information, same thing with the file name. And then you see a data attribute. So we can go check out that data attribute and look at this data run. And we see the SAM file is stored at cluster you know, 1058408, and it's 64 clusters in length. And the cluster, again, is 4096 bytes. And so what all I'm doing in the background is going using that invoke DD concept and going to cluster 1058408 and then reading for 64 clusters. Um, and then there's, there are some things that, so most files aren't, you know, 4096, they're not multiple sizes of multiples of 4096, and so you would have to take in the consideration uh, the allocated or real size, and then kind of cut, that, cut down some fluff on the end to be able to have a true copy of a file. And so um, kind of to show that, we can do copy file raw. I'm probably getting ahead of myself on the slides, but that's fine. All right, let's do notepad. And so now I just copied notepad and using that same method to where I'm kind of going under everything. And so uh, I think it's file hash. So the hash for the notepad, the SHA-256 is whatever that is. And then if we were to go, hopefully this works. Yeah, so you have the same SHA-256 because it's literally making a bit for bit copy of that file. So that's pretty cool. Um, then you have this concept of alternate data streams. And I kind of like, well, I, I just deleted the file that had alternate, an alternate data stream. But the idea is that those data attributes TFS made it to where a file doesn't only have to have the main data attribute, they can have as many additional data attributes as you want. And so uh, they've named that concept alternate data streams. And so uh, a lot of attackers have found ways to actually hide their malware in alternate data streams. Let me kind of check the time here. Okay, we've got like 30 more minutes. Um, so then, then they, they'll actually write their malware to alternate data streams and then execute from there. And so. Um, there's not really a good way to search for alternate data streams throughout an entire drive. Uh, the directory listing command, so dir, has a slash r um, option inside of uh, Windows 7 and greater. That allows you to do that, but it's relatively slow. And so um, what I did is just write a get alternate data stream commandlet. And so what instead of listing out alternate data streams, what I do is I get the MFT, and then I look for anything that has two data streams, basically, and then I'll, I'll notify you about that. And so um, what we could do is ADS equals get alternate data stream, volume name, slash, 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 C colon. Ah, oh, damn. OK. Let's see if it works now. I stored, nah, that sucks. Okay, so these are all the different alternate data streams that are coming up, right? And so um, you'll see these zone identifiers. Those are the things I was talking about earlier. So literally all these files were downloaded from the internet. You also see Dropbox apparently uh, will write some zone ident or some uh, alternate data streams on there. What you're looking for is anything, well, you have a couple options, right? If you want to find files that were downloaded from the internet, you can just look for anything that has a zone identifier. Or if you want to see things that, you know, like these are built-in ones, that $J and dollar $.max. Um, but you might look for something that doesn't match zone identifier or dropbox.com. And then it would show you kind of a subversive, somebody trying to do something crazy like this Jared guy here. All right. And so that's, that's one that I made that I don't think it was anything. It might have said like evil inside of it or something like that. And so these, these are kind of the commandlets or different ways to use it. So if you want to find you know, something downloaded from the inter Internet Explorer, you would use Stream name equals zone identifier. Um, you can get it for a specific path. So US and journal, for example, has dollar J and dollar max. 
And then you can also say where it's not zone identifier to kind of cut down on the fluff there. All right. So we've kind of talked about all the different attributes that a file you know, typically has. And so uh, files will have a standard information, a file name, and a data attribute. Um, directories, on the other hand, will have a standard information, a file name, and then an index root and index allocation attribute. And so what these are is uh, NTFS treats directories as if they're files. The only difference is that as opposed to containing data, they cont contain indexes that point to uh, the files that are contained within them. And so um, this is what the index root looks like. And so it's, a, it's a actually formed as a B tree, so a binary tree. And that's really fun to write code to parse. And so inside of it, it's going to have every, every uh, node inside of the B tree is going to actually have its own file name attribute. So it's kind of a, a you know, in, a, I don't know what the word is, but a file name attribute inside of the index root attribute. And so the index root is going to have one, you know, some small number of them. And if, if it's a large directory, then it's going to have an index allocation attribute, which is much more complicated. Um, and so there could be multiple index allocation attributes, and they're going to be uh, non-resident. So this is kind of showing that non-resident. And we see that data run here. The data run will point us to where we need to go look to find that index allocation index block. And so here we see that there's, you know, for example, hello world.txt and test are a couple of files that are located within there. And so if you want to, if you really want to get deep into how NTFS stores files, then this is probably a pretty fun thing for you. Um, and so what I've, what I've done is I've, you have get child item, which is similar to LS or DIR. And so I just made a raw version of that to parse out the index allocation. And so you could get child item raw. Well, let's just show get child item for C colon slash, right? And so it comes out, there's, what is that, seven, seven files. But if we do get child item raw, we see that there's a pretty significantly larger amount of files, right? And so these are all those, remember those files that I told you about, the dollar ad, adder def, dollar bad cluster, dollar MFT? Those are all stored within the root directory. They're just hidden from you, right? And so I'm able to kind of show you what's, what's hidden from you. Um, through that, and it will also tell you what their actual record number is because that's stored in that file file name attribute. And so you could do that; uh, you could give it a path, or you can you could run that against an individual um, file. Let's see. And then uh, the kind of the alternative that's oh man, that went crazy. Okay, so the alternative is kind of this get file record index. So if you want to. Let's say you don't know uh, what the file record is for notepad.exe. Remember, it's like 24212, but nobody's going to know that just off the top of their head. And it's not going to be the same on every computer. Um, then you would go ahead and uh, run git file record index, give it a path, and then that's going to output um, 24212 in this case. And so we can do. do cmd.exe, right? So we see that it's 32349, and then we could do git file record. And so these, these command lines, a lot of them are smart enough to know that if you give it an integer, then it's, you're looking at an index. A lot of them, you don't have to actually type it all out. And so uh, this is cmd.exe, kind of the interesting thing. You're probably like, oh, well, that's not in system 32, right? So you see Windows, Windows side by side, some x86 thing. Um, if you do expand property attribute, come on, then you see that there's cmd.exe actually has two different file names. And so one of them is pointing to parent record 3406, and one of them is pointing to parent record 6323, right? And so that's what we call a hard, a hard link, right? And so rather than store a file multiple times, they just store it in one place on disk and then have different uh, parent directories uh, reference that. And so if we were to do 3406, I think. They did that for all the files in that side-by-side. Yeah, yep. yeah, it's going to be. And so you see 3406 is uh, Windows System 32. It just happens that that was the first one, so that value got overwritten the way that I have the code written right now. I'll probably fix it to where you have like an array of file names, but I just haven't done that yet. And so the other one is going to be that Windows side-by-side -side directory. And so that's how, that's how hard links work kind of under the hood for an NTFS. 
All right, so the US in Journal, earlier I mentioned that this is probably like one of the, one of the coolest things you can, you can pull out. And so it, uh, if you've ever heard of NTFS as a journaling file system, this is where the journaling occurs. And so uh, basically it keeps track of changes or file operations on uh, files and directories on a volume. Um, the changes are going to be documented with the file name, the, uh, the file index, like the index number in the MFT, the parent index number in the MFT, and then I think it's also going to have like a description of the change. And then uh, this was originally kind of created to be leveraged by backup utilities, and so when I'm doing a backup, rather than look at every single file on a volume to see if it's been changed, why don't I just reference the journal that tells me, hey, over this period of time, these files have been changed. And so that way, you, your backup process is a lot faster. So like volume shadow service and things of that nature. Um, this file, earlier I showed that there was like a dollar max and a dollar J alternate data stream. The dollar max is going to be information, kind of metadata about the volume or the US in journal. And then the dollar J will contain the actual entries. Here's the different reasons that uh, you would create a US in journal entry. Uh, some of the cooler ones are like data, you know, data overwrite or file create, file delete. Um, one of my personal favorites is stream change. So anytime somebody creates an alternate data stream, rather than using my git ads uh, commandlet, you can just go look at the USN journal for stream change reasons, reason codes. And once you find that, then you know that somebody's created an alternate data stream. Oops, I'm going crazy here. Um, this is what the dollar max is. It's relatively like, you know, not that exciting. And so it kind of keeps things like the different, the maximum size. It has a USN uh, ID, which is some special like thing that it uses in order to create weird USN IDs. But it's actually just a date time, so that like the timestamp for when the volume was created. And then you have the lowest valid USN. Uh, n not a lot of people actually use this at all because you could just literally go in and parse the actual values without any of this information. And so if you wanted to parse it, then you could use get USN journal information, give it a volume, and you would parse it out. This is kind of the more compelling piece. And so this is the USN Journal dollar J data stream. And so these are the different, this is kind of how uh, each record looks. So this is an example of two records, but in reality, you're gonna have you know, 400,000 records. And so kind of the important things are like the file name, the file reference and the parent reference, because that allows you to pivot back into the MFT and kind of learn a little bit more about it. Um, the reason for why, what happened, and then the timestamp is you know, pretty important, so. And to, to look at that, you have Git US in Journal. Git US in Journal will allow you to uh, look at every single uh, US in Journal entry, or you can give it a USN number, and it will pull out just that individual one. The way that you get that is going back to that standard, standard information attribute, which has a reference to the most recent US in Journal entry. And so show that real quick, because that was kind of a lot. And uh, so $USN equals Git US in Journal. And so in like three or four seconds-ish, dollar USN comes back. And in this case, 324,909 records, right? And so um, we can look at, let's look at some like random number. And so here it is, uh, O dash discovery service, whatever, dot dat was, you know, overridden, extended, truncated, and closed all at uh, 826, 2015 at 12.39 PM. So, um, and then if you were to want to, if you wanted to look for that file, you can then go to this record number in the MFT. So we can, this file could have been deleted and overwritten by, by now. So just kind of, hopefully this works. Just shooting, you know, just shooting to see if it works, who knows. All right, so now we have an MFT and we could just do 16203. Oh yeah, hey, it worked. And so now we see that we have, you know, this file right here and so pretty cool I think anyway and so now you can like look at the different timestamps and the data that's contained within there and all that kind of stuff so you could pivot off of there um, let's see so the journal is it's a cyclical um, file and so it overwrites itself kind of eats its tail it's like snake that old video game um, in my experience it really matters on how many file operations you have on your system but in my experience it's been like two to four weeks and so um, it's one of those things that you need to kind of have a process around. So like one thing that I would recommend is monitoring the USN journal every few days to see if an uh, alternate data stream was created or something like that. But if you're, you know, going back to a to investigate a system that was hacked, you know, six months ago, there might not be any evidence that's worthwhile. 
Um, let's see. Let's kind of show here. Let's see. MFT dot attribute. And so the standard information is always basically uh, is always the first attribute. So you could do attribute zero. And then you see this update sequence number. And so that refers to the, the USN journal. So we could do get USN journal dash USN. And if all goes right, so now we're pivoting from the MFT back into the USN journal. It's actually the same, same record, I think. But in, it's the most recent record of, in the USN journal for that file. And so I, I haven't really figured out a reason why that would be super useful to somebody, because the chances that you know, that file operation that's most recent is the one that you're looking for is pretty low, I would imagine. But um, in concept, that's what you would do. Again, you would probably want to use that temporal pivoting to be able to pivot around and uh, grab only relevant uh, timestamps. Um, and then you could kind of look for uh, data execution and all that kind of stuff. Let's see how we're doing here. We've got 15 more minutes. Okay, so uh, kind of one of the cooler, so one of the things that I'm doing, um, building out are like artifact parsers. And so one of the cooler artifacts, in my opinion, is the Windows Prefetch. And so uh, the idea is, is that rather than access the file directly to parse it out, I'm going to use all of that stuff that I just talked about in order to access the raw bytes of that file. And then I'm going to parse out the binary formats of these files. And so um, prefetch, this is a little something I made. But the idea is, is that the prefetcher is a memory management deal that tries to speed up the uh, load of executables. And so what happens is a user launches minesweeper.exe or you know, cmd.exe. The cache manager actually looks for a prefetch file to see if one's been created. If one has not been created, then it will actually monitor the first 10 seconds of uh, that file's execution and look for memory, what they call memory faults. And so um, basically a memory fault is any time that the, uh, the, uh, OS or the OS or the CPU has to actually go into the hard drive to grab data. Every time that happens, then it writes that down into a prefetch file, right? And so um, th that way, the next time you run minesweeper.exe, it's going to be a faster load process because it can load everything up as soon as you double click it as opposed to waiting until that memory fault. And so um, the reason why I use minesweeper.exe is because that was like when I was little, I was like the 24th best minesweeper player in the world. And that was like my nerdiness, I guess. In fact, I just won $2,000 at uh, Black Hat for being the best minesweeper so player. Like yeah. Yeah, it's it yeah, it freaking sweet. My friend called me and was like, dude, they're playing Minesweeper at Black Hat and giving away money. I was like, I'm there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, it, it, was, it was sad because I was out drinking, and he texted me and was like, hey, if you're, not, if you're at Black Hat, you need to go play Minesweeper. I'm like, all right. Uh, 56 seconds on Expert, yeah. So not, not anymore. My, you know, I have old wrists now, and so it's not quite as, not quite as good. And then this is what the... So, a lot of people, when they look at prefetch, they look at like just, <laughs> yeah, they look at just metadata about prefetch, right? And so like the time, the timestamps when you list out a, a file. Um, really, there's a lot more information stored within the file itself. So not only are you finding the raw bytes, but now you need to parse out those raw bytes. Um, and this is really hard to see, I know, but that's kind of the point: is that there's a lot of information in there that you need to kind of parse out. And so that's what this this kind of does. And so. Uh, you can do get prefetch tack volume names slash slash dot slash c colon and it will parse out every prefetch file in the Windows prefetch directory, which is where you expect prefetch to be. Or you can give it a path, um, assuming that you want to look at just one prefetch. And so this is what the object looks like. It says, hey, cmd.exe was run at these different times. And then uh, these were the dependency files that, that, were run, that were needed. So those were the files that the when the prefetch was made, those are the files that the uh, that the CPU had to go down into uh, the disk and pull out. Let's see. Um, another thing that you can do with the US and journal that's pretty cool is you can look for, let's just do this. What was it? I forget. It's like stream change or something like that. Oh, no. Not reason. Whoops, sorry. File name. Back like PF. All right, so now what we're doing is we're looking for any US in journal entry on a prefetch file. And so now we see literally any time that a prefetch file was updated, right? And so there was a lot of research uh, originally in Windows, Windows 7 and Windows XP, prefetch uh, files kept track of the last access time. And then in Windows 8, they were smart enough to add in seven more uh, timestamps so that you can 
track back the last eight times a file was accessed. Well, with US and Journal, you could track back the last X number of times that a file was accessed within like a month, right? And so that, that could be less than eight. It could be a shit ton more than eight. And so you, you don't really know, but it gives you a ton more fidelity um, on your prefetching to see. And the prefetch is really cool because it tells you when uh, executables were executed, right? And so that could be a really good telltale sign of something. All right. And then uh, kind of the last thing that I wanted to touch on was the scheduled job concept. And so this is just another random one. So get scheduled job. It, a lot of you are like familiar with um, with like at jobs, right? So for a lot of hackers, we'll use at jobs to run things as system and then uh, or to run them at scheduled predefined times. And so uh, we can go into the C Windows task directory and parse out these scheduled jobs and see things like uh, this was actually <laughs> when I was doing a demo for my previous talk, launcher.bat was a, uh, basically a, a launcher for a malware uh, callback. And so uh, this, it was run at 3.31 p.m. on 8.19.2015. And so that's just kind of an example. The, the weird thing is, is on PowerShell 3.0, they have a get scheduled job, but it doesn't do anything. So um, get scheduled job raw returns more stuff. I don't know what, what they're doing in the background, but they're not doing the same thing that I'm doing. So. And right now, this only does uh, at jobs, which are kind of the old school version. And then there's also scheduled tasks, and they're, they're formatted different, so I, I don't parse those yet. But at some point, you can expect that in the future. Uh, moving, so that kind of wraps up most of what I want to talk about. Um, but mo moving forward, I, I want to support more artifacts. So that, that's things like the registry is probably one of the big targets that I have in the future. And then ESE databases, so like the Windows Search Indexer and a lot of, a lot of their like kind of database stuff for Windows is moving to ESE, the ESE format, or JetBlue they call it. I'm trying to build out that organic remoting concept with uh, MBD server. Um, and I could talk about that later if somebody is interested in that. Support for alternate file systems. So I found that even though I'm running from PowerShell, if I have access to a, to a disk, it doesn't really matter because I'll write the parsing code myself. And so I've started working with ext4, um, but eventually would like to support all these different kinds of file systems. Um, because it's a .NET assembly, there's like basically an open API that you can you know, kind of like chunk things together like a puzzle and build out your own capabilities. And so I want to build out some online documentation for people to work with that. And then uh, community involvement, if any of you are interested in you know, helping out with parsers and things like that, I would greatly appreciate it. So, um, and beyond that, that's pretty much all I have. Are there any questions or anything that anybody's extremely interested in? We have about 10 minutes till the closing, closing remarks, I guess, tomorrow, or for the conference. No? Have you talked about the remote map stuff? Say that again, sorry. Have you talked about the remote map? Mm -hmm. No, yeah, so I actually recommend that you don't do that because you can then use the module to grab things that you don't have permissions to grab. So, in fact, uh, the, there's a dollar secure file in, the, in NTFS that has all the different file security uh, parameters and so like the uh, security permissions. And so that was one of the harder uh, things to parse. But in my case, I don't care about that. So I just don't care about permissions at all. And so everybody has permissions to everything <laughs> as long as you're an administrative user. Um, the remoting, the way that I'm doing it, is using MBD, which is network block device. It's an old like Linux method to be able to share out, like mount remote remote drives. And so the way that I'm doing it is I wrote my own MBD server in PowerShell, and you could push that out, execute it, and it will host out uh, basically the physical drive zero or volume. And then you send it a request that says, hey, I'm interested in bytes zero through 512, and it will send those over the wire to you. Um, it's it becomes more complicated when you're dealing with those fragmented files and all the kind of complexities. And so I haven't built all that out, but uh, it works with Git MBR um, right now. So yeah, so F so I, yeah, I try not to be super vendory, but uh, F response is probably it works right now with F response. Um, and F response is relatively inexpensive. It's like three thousand U.S. dollars per for a year license, um, which in the forensics world is super cheap. And so uh, F-Response is really sweet. And that's basically I was trying to, uh, MBD, I'm trying to create an open source version of F-Response, but it will never be as well supported or as, you know, as, as good of a tool as F-Response. That's, that's not my intention. It's just a free version of something similar to that. Uh, yeah.
Yeah. Right. As a responder or analyst, should we be maybe uh, invoking PowerShell maybe in a separate way so that we need to do full parameters? Yeah, so I, I didn't really go into that today, but in theory, if you're using FRESPONSE or something like that, the only thing running on the remote system is FRESPONSE, right? And it's running in, in memory. I guess it creates a service, so it's on disk as well, but um, FRESPONSE is running. PowerShell is only running on your analyst workstation, and so you wouldn't be muddying the waters if you're doing it in that, that manner. But yeah, so yesterday, uh, yesterday I, in my presentation, I showed an, an analysis of uh, a PowerShell RAT that my coworkers wrote called Empire. And so uh, that is like the quintessential um, PowerShell attack platform now, I guess. And so um, it, you know, you could see you're not muddying up the waters by using this tool if you're going through FRESPONSE or something along those lines. Anybody else? Sorry. Yeah. So I was using that was that tool I was using yesterday was called FRESPONSE. Yeah. And it, yeah, like I said, FRESPONSE, there's their enterprise license that has uh, literally no limits on it is like three thousand dollars. So it's pretty affordable for most most organizations, I would think. Anybody else? Okay. Cool. Yeah, and I'll I'll be around all day. So if you have any further questions that you don't want to ask in public, then feel free. So. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys.